Go Vegan Radio with Bob Linden at GoVeganRadio.com on Twitter at Go Vegan Radio and uh, Facebook, Go Vegan Radio with Bob Linden. And today we have uh, another interesting discussion, I predict, uh, with Wayne Shun, founder of Direct Action Everywhere, and uh, Gary Francione. And uh, oh, some months back we had uh, a rather interesting discussion going on and I'm very interested in where animal activism uh, has been, where it is and where it's going. I'm uh, quite upset with what portrays itself as an animal rights movement. Uh, most of the um, headliners at the so-called animal rights conference I feel are industry, in, in, industry collaborators uh, and we can see that with what's happening in California now with the uh, prevent cruelty uh, resolution that prevents no cruelty whatsoever. So there's so much deception uh, that goes on, so much corruption. Um, and, you know, what, what I have come to uh, conclude uh, is that the most important activism is vegan advocacy. Now, I don't really see... Uh, vegan advocacy happening with Direct Action Everywhere, but Direct Action Everywhere, DXC, is getting a lot of attention. Um, a huge article that was in The Intercept with uh, Glenn Greenwald, and then there were uh, disruptions at uh, Dodger, uh, San Francisco, L.A. Dodger, San Francisco Giant uh, Games, and uh, at uh, political rallies, Bernie Sanders rallies, and Hillary Clinton uh, rallies, and all, all of which I'd, I'd like to discuss. I, I actually, um, just in, in thinking about what we might discuss today, I just jotted down a, a bunch of notes, and I, I might just, you know, go into that just a little bit here and then um, say that maybe we'll get back to what I'm mentioning here, but uh, I'll have uh, Gary jump in. I know he's interested in talking to you, Wayne, also. And, you know, we have Gary on every week um, doing commentary, and he is, of course, a renowned law professor at Rutgers University. Um, I guess we should mention, uh, Wayne, your background a little bit, that uh, you, uh, you also... Um, have a law degree and you've taught law. Tell, tell us a bit about your, your law history and your, your educational background. Well, I have to confess, I'm not nearly as accomplished as Gary. I tried to be a law professor and failed, unfortunately, but uh, I did my best and I learned a lot from Gary in the process. Gary was one of the people I considered a mentor intellectually and in person. Um, I met him a few times at the University of Chicago Law School where I was in law school. But I went to law school because I wanted to do great work for animals. And if I had read Gary's work before I went to law school, I might have known that maybe law school wasn't the best route for me to take. But in law school, I did learn from people like Gary Francione, Tom Regan. I worked with people like Cass Sunstein and Martha Nussbaum on working for animals and trying to protect the animals of the legal system. And immediately afterwards, I went to Northwestern, taught at law, and did kind of a combination of environmental law, animal law, and behavioral law and economics. And it's been a long road since that time. That was over 10 years ago now, but I'm still incredibly grateful to Gary for all the lessons that I've taught. And wait, honestly, wait, 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 we met, was it, God, it must have been, I guess it was, um, when, because I met you when I came to give that paper that was published in the Chicago, University of Chicago Law Forum, I think that was the first time I met you. When was that? Do you remember when that was? I believe it was 2003, but it might have been 2004. <laughs> Oh, my. <laughs> my, how time flies. <laughs> yeah, and I have to say, Gary, I told you at the time, but you totally blew me away. And I had been somewhat familiar with your work at that point, but hearing you speak and then reading Rain Without Thunder really transformed the direction my activism took. Because up until that point, I was 100% on the animal welfare bandwagon. And after that, you know, I, I hope I've changed a little bit. So I, and, and uh, so you say Gary had a major influence on you. Do you remember specifically? Like, do you um, what? What can you recall? To, uh, anything further regarding? It had that? honestly never even occurred to me that some of the animal protection legislation that, and, and animal welfare measures that corporations were taking might be counterproductive. Because I just assumed that kind of what everyone assumed in the animal rights movement at the time, who was new to the movement, which was that. Anything that's good for animals or anything that seems to be good for animals is something we should be pushing. And 
In Rain Without Thunder, I think Gary very compellingly argues that some of these kind of voluntary commitments corporations are being made are nothing more than marketing platforms. They're an opportunity for corporations to make more money by reinforcing the notion that animals are commodities for us to use. And that basic philosophical and logical and factual point was honestly just something that never occurred to me until Gary presented it to me. So, I mean, I, I always say every time I talk to anyone about my beginnings as an animal rights activist, you know, I think before that I was an animal protection advocate. I was an animal welfare advocate. I was a dog and cat lover. But Gary, you're, you're the one who made me an animal rights advocate in 2003 or 2004. Well, then, then it would seem like with a little guidance, I, I, know, I know that Gary seems to feel that you've got off course a bit with your activism, and it sounds like, you know, by getting you two together here, maybe, maybe we can uh, put, put things uh, on, on, on the right path. And I have to say, Gary wakes up a lot of people. You know, I remember way back in my past there, I was collecting signatures for uh, HSUS, and, and, you know, it was I was battling the... Uh, steel leg hole traps and you know thinking I was doing the right thing and then uh, I find that uh, that that was no resolution that uh, they simply switched to using snares or or padded leg hole traps you know it was like huh what a, what a scam that was you know we thought we were going for some result and then Gary in, in coming on this radio show which is now 17 years old this month uh, Gary, I think, uh, woke up a lot of people, including myself. And, um, you know, in, to the extent that, that uh, he has asserted that vegan activism and advocacy is so foundational, so basic. Um, and I feel that, you know, that's that's what I truly feel. And, and I feel that um, going off in other directions or there, there are distractions along the way that are, that are taking us to places. I mean, I, I actually admire the energy of direct action everywhere. And, you know, I, I've been out there on the street. I've gone through many megaphones myself. But, I, you know, my concerns are that th there's no vegan message. I'm, I'm seeing, and again, as, as you were on the last time, I, I, as I expressed, I feel that there's a lot of um, vague sloganeering, you know, until every animal is free. Um, that, you know, okay, I'm with you on that. What, what do I have to do, you know, to, to, to get every animal to go free? Well, I think it's we all have to go vegan, but I don't hear that, you know, like the call to action on what we're supposed to do. It's not food. It's violence. Okay, I'm with you. Should I get less violent food or what should I do well oh I should go vegan well why didn't you tell me that you know and animal liberation now what you know, what does that mean you know I I, st I marched with DXE in San Francisco we were at um, Union Square and for 20 I minutes we were chanting what do we want animal liberation when do we want it now but, and we had a big crowd but our 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 slogan was repetitive what who you who doesn't want animal liberation all the people there thumbs up i'm with with you for animal liberation well what do i have to do what do i have to do well you have to go vegan that liberates the animals and so what what am i missing here <laughs> wayne and gary help me well i'm i can't be of much help here because i, I to be honest <laughs> wayne to be honest i I am actually puzzled by what the position, and I'm hoping that today I'll learn some because I I um, am very puzzled by the position that your organization takes, and um, I hear what you're saying, and but yet you know I I look at your website and you denigrate veganism. Um, I mean it, it it's troubling to me that you you completely um, ignore that there is a vegan movement out there that is um, a lot more than something that's resulting in powerless and isolated vegans or people who are only focusing on the diet question or people who are not focusing on broader questions. I, 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 I find that very puzzling. I don't understand. Um, I don't understand why you say it. And then I, I look at your website and I see things like you're promoting the anti-fur uh, campaign in San Francisco, or you're urging people to write to Costco's CEO and tell them to cut ties, tell Costco to cut ties with animal abusing farms. Well, I, you know, I don't understand. All farms are animal abusing farms. 
Um, so I, I guess I'm confused. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing, I hear what you're saying, but what I'm seeing is a group that really is um, with some superficial differences, but really no different ideologically from Mercy for Animals or, you know, or, or PETA or any of the neo-welfarist organizations um, that, that promote a lot of really problematic stuff. And so I, I guess I'm, I guess I'm really, I'm really confused by what your position is. I mean, let me ask you a question, Wayne, and, and maybe this will help us. Let me ask you a question. Do you have any doubt that in order for us to shift the paradigm from animals as property to animals as non-human persons if you and i don't use animal liberation i use animal rights because as you know animal liberation is a concept that is very much associated with peter singer i reject but um but do you have any doubt that if we're going to shift the paradigm we need to have a huge number of vegans that that nothing will happen until we have a large number of people who are committed to veganism as a matter of justice, not not as a dietary thing or for health reasons or or because you know for because Beyonce does it or anything like that, but but that people who are committed to veganism, not eating, wearing, using animals as a matter of social justice. Do you have any doubt in your mind that we need that movement before we will ever see any change? I have no doubt, Gary, and I think the question, and I think the main small disagreement for me between you and I is how we get there. That, you know, my view is that the way we get there is to unify movement, including the Mercy Frannels and Peters of the world, who, while there are certainly things they do that I don't agree with, I think we have to be working with them rather than against them. But wait. Say, get those people t- to be unified in speaking out, not just in being vegans quietly in their own homes, but being empowered and trained inspired to go take action on the streets, talk to people, do vegan education. And just briefly, Gary, the last conversation I had with you did change some things about the work that I do. So I'll give you an example. At our most recent Fur Free Friday March, guess what sign we probably had more of than any other sign? A vegan sign. And and part of that was because, frankly, you changed my mind a little bit in the last conversation, and maybe even more than a little bit, because you know, prior to that, I had been worried about the dynamics of focusing on consumer change in a city where consumer activism has a bad rap for better or for worse. And in the Bay Area, when you talk about consumer activism, people don't like that. But but I thought that you made some really valid points. And so we have programs like Carnivores Anonymous where we're focusing on vegan education in non-vegan communities. We have vegan signs at even our fur marches. When we talked to Katie Tang and the San Francisco Board of Supervisors yesterday, guess what was the large portion of our conversation? It wasn't actually fur. It was actually about animals used for food and what, what action we could take with the city to stop the violence against animals in the food industry. So all these things are things that are product of conversations you've had with me, Gary. And, and I, every time I come through the New York area in the Northeast, I, I'd always encourage you to sit down with me and give me more feedback because you've offered a lot of wisdom in the past. And I know there are things that I'm doing wrong, and I hope you... Uh, Give me the benefit of the doubt and help me correct them so I can do better things in the future. I appreciate the spirit of your comments, but I'm and I really do, Wayne. I'm just I'm I'm puzzled because, first of all, let's let's just go back over a couple of things you said just now. Um, You were talking about, um, you know, having vegan signs at an anti uh, fur uh, rally or at Fur Free Friday. Yeah, Fur Free Friday. Um, We did that because of you, Gary. Honestly, I mean, that's a big part of it. But but do you think there's any difference between fur and wool and leather or anything like that? I mean, why why are we singling out fur? Because isn't it the case, Wayne, that when we have an anti-fur rally or campaign, that requires a coalition of people, many of whom are wearing wool and leather and whatnot, but who think that fur is is bad? I mean, I, I've been been doing this, Wayne, for a long time. I've seen this. I, I have I have. Um, I think the anti-fur campaign is a perfect example of why single-issue campaigns are problematic in lots of ways and don't work, uh, because they require coalitions of people um, who are engaged in other forms of exploitation. That, in order to have those coalitions, they have to um, they have to believe that what they're doing is morally better than what other people are morally doing are, are, are doing rather as a moral matter. And, and that, that is, um, 
you know, it, it, it it's a recipe for disaster. I, I, I don't really. And, and, and on top of that, the Any Fur campaign has been one of the most incredibly sexist campaigns. It has been it has been thoroughly polluted by misogyny and sexism from the very beginning. And that continues now. Um, so I'm not sure when 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 we talk about these things, I I get I become very puzzled because, um, you know, you say, for example, Wayne, that that we ought to work with the pitas of this world. Now, as you know, or whether you know or don't know, um, in the early 1980s, I began uh, my activism with PETA. Um, I, I, I met uh, the PETA folks when PETA was a very small organization and worked with them on a pro bono basis in, in well into the 1990s. And um, so I, I, I am, uh, was, was once uh, very good friends with both Ingrid Newkirk and Alex Pacheco and with, uh, with the other folks of PETA. And one of the things that, I mean, when I look at PETA and I look at their killing, 95% of the animals they take in at the Norfolk facility now I understand the thinking there. I, I I know how that goes in terms of the belief that uh, if you adopt animals out, there's a chance that they'll have a bad home. I guess that's true of children, human children as well. But it doesn't justify killing. When you're talking, I mean, you're talking about killing a fairly large number of animals every single year. I look at PETA's campaigns, which are relentlessly misogynistic. I look at the fact that they gave an award to Temple Grandin, a slaughterhouse designer. I look at the fact that they gave an award to Patrick Buchanan, a man who has uh, deeply troubling attitudes about uh, uh, immigration and things like that. Um, I, I look at their reactionary position. I mean, let's just focus on their sex. How how. How can one work with an organization that relentlessly promotes misogyny and sexism? How are we ever going to have justice for animals if we are engaging, promoting, and supporting misogyny and sexism? I don't understand that. Final point with what you just said. Um, you know, I look at, at groups like Mercy for Animals and PETA, I, I have nothing to do with what they do. I, I, it's, I have absolutely no desire to work with them because they do something very different. They both promote a vision of, you know, that one can can exploit in better ways and, and that there are right ways to do the wrong thing. And I reject that. And I also reject the idea that, that what I am doing and what other, other people who promote abolition are doing uh, is consumerist. It's not. It's about. Yeah. It's not about consumerism, and it's not about consumer activism. It's about social justice. It's about fundamental fairness, Wayne. It's about educating people about how, if they believe animals matter morally, then veganism is the only rational response. That's not a matter of consumer activism. That's a matter of fundamental moral education. And so I think we just, you know, look, fair enough, Wayne, we see things in a different way. And I understand that you run a group. I don't. You have to do fundraising. I don't. I have a job. I go and I teach law and I get paid and I do this stuff in my 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 spare time. Um, and and and, you know, you run a group. Uh, you have to fundraise. You have to bring money in to support yourself and the other people that work there. I understand that. But you know, I also think that you've been not quite fair in terms of how you've portrayed veganism. Ironically, the consumerist and really problematic aspects of veganism that you identify are promoted by the exact groups that you support, Wayne, the groups that you partner with. The I mean, the idea that you have a problem with veganism and, and yet you support groups like Mercy for Animals or groups like PETA. I just I it confuses me and I'm not trying to be argumentative. Honestly, oh, Wayne, oh. I'm puzzled. I'm truly puzzled. Yeah, I mean Wayne? those those are great points, Gary. And if I can distill them, I think the, the two main points are one, you know, how do we distinguish between fur and all these other forms of animal exploitation? And second, 
how do we work with groups when we think that some of the things they're doing might be mistakes, might even be ethical mistakes. So I'll, I'll just take each of those points in turn. With respect to the first point, I, I agree with you 100% that there is no difference between fur and leather. The only difference from a pragmatic perspective is we can ban fur in San Francisco and save probably 20,000 animals from torment and fur farms, and we can't ban leather yet. So but it's, Wayne, it's Wayne, you're not, there are people so, are not, if, if, you ban, if you ban fur, Wayne, you're my, not. Is, that, is it okay if I just finish my point real quick? Well, it's it's sort of, you know, I mean, it, uh, go, sure, fine, go ahead. Sure. No, but I, I just want to make the point that in the actual legislation that we passed or we presented before the board and it, it uh -huh. like, will pass in the next three weeks in San Francisco, it expressly says that San Francisco is a city that believes in kindness towards animals. Not just human animals, but non-human animals as well. And so this law will be a foundation for further legislation. And if you look at the history of social justice, voting rights didn't happen for everyone in the country at once. It happened for people of color first with the 15th Amendment. And then it took close to 60 years before we passed it for women, too. And so I think sometimes – I agree with you 100 percent, Gary, that we have to have our vision in, in our crosshairs, that we have to understand that we're not going to stop here. That after we ban fur, we have to go after leather, we have to go to the meat industry, we have to go after experimentation, circuses, and everything. Because all animal exploitation is the same. You're right. But I think strategically targeting certain campaigns that we can win now is important for the movement to build. So th on the second point, should we work with groups that have policies or practices that we don't agree with and that might even have ethical flaws? I think we absolutely have to. And I think this is a problem with the modern left. And honestly, I think you've done some great work in this area where the purity policies of the left have destroyed some of the greatest activists on the left, and I know you've been attacked mercilessly by people who identify as progressive, and this is something the right does much better than us. They unify, and and one of the things that I've learned as an anti-racist activist, as an environmental activist, and as an animal rights activist is that we're stronger for it together. So while I, I don't agree with everything that PETA does, I don't agree with everything that Mercy for Animal does, I'm sure I don't agree with everything that you do, honestly, either. And I'm sure all of you, all of PETA, MFA, and you don't agree with everything that DIC does. We are all stronger if we're together. And so my mission as an animal rights activist is to build big coalitions, even across movements, so that all these groups, instead of looking at our flaws, focus on the flaws for sure. Have constructive dialogue, have compassion for each other, and try and educate each other, as you've done so excellently over the past, I think, 30-plus years. But at the end of the day, we have to work together against the big systems of oppression, against the Smithfields of the world, if we're going to win. Well, but Wayne, now, interestingly... Um, you talked about how we make incremental change in social justice, but as um, you know, I, I wrote a long time ago um, and have stated a number of times since, you can't compare – when you decide that a group of humans matter and they're part of the moral community and then the question becomes how do you accord treatment to them that, that – that, that, that results in equal consideration. And, you know, you can't compare that situation. We didn't get rid of slavery incrementally. I mean, you know, we're talking about the difference between shifting the paradigm from property to persons with respect to animals. You don't do that. You don't do that by making animal exploitation more humane or by 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 opposing fur or things like that um you, you don't do that i mean once you liberate the slaves then you have the discussion about um you know well, what does equal consideration require in terms of how we treat everybody but you can't have that discussion while people are still property you couldn't have that discussion in 1843 you could only have that discussion after slavery ended so you can't ha – I mean to, 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 to try to compare these things and say, well, you know, we've made change – you know, we made incremental progress in civil rights. Um, right, but, but the problem or the, 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 the characteristic there was you had humans who were no longer considered as property and the discussion was what does equal consideration require? It, yeah. it, it, we, weren't, we weren't talking about incrementally – um, eradicating slavery, which is what you're talking about when you know and, 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 and if there's anything that is fundamental in my work, if there is anything that is fundamental in my work, it's the idea that you can't incrementally eradicate the property status of animals. You need a paradigm shift. And the only way that paradigm shift happens is if a large number of people come to the position that eating, wearing, using, and exploiting animals in any way is morally unacceptable. That's the only way the system's going to change. The problem is not the slaughterhouses. It's not the, it's not the institutional exploiters. It's the fact that, that most people don't see this as wrong.
And so as long as most people don't see it as wrong, the suppliers, I mean, capitalists are indifferent as to whether or not they sell beef or bananas. If there's demand for beef, they'll sell beef. If there's more demand for bananas, they'll sell bananas. So the problem really isn't the suppliers or the institutional exploiters. They're simply responding to the fact that we live in a culture in which most people demand uh, and the products of animal exploitation. And so that's never going to change unless we have a significant vegan movement. And wh- one of the things that troubles me is when you say, well, you know, we're stronger together, but you're assuming that there's that that we're uni- that we're unified in what it is we want. And and when I hear Nathan Runkle, who I guess is no longer the head of Mercy for Animals, but was when he made the statement that, um, you know, oh, yeah, veganism is the gold standard. But, you know, people don't have to be vegan as long as they're, you know, they're buying cage free eggs or they're promoting more humane forms, forms of exploitation. Um I, I that's a position that I find, you know, that's that's not a question. That's not a, an issue, Wayne, of whether it's it's possibly or 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 pra, or perhaps morally problematic that is morally problematic that's morally obscene and so is the sexism of PETA I mean I'm so surprised and very disappointed that that um, you that I I mean I think PETA's sexism uh, which is one of the reasons why not the only reason why but it's one of the reasons why I stopped working with them I thought the sexism was just appalling and it got even worse I mean you know it's 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 it went from it went from sexism to the sort of rank uh, 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 dramatically misogynistic uh, characterizations and exploitation of women. I think it's just dreadful. And you know, if if you think we're really going to stop treating animals like meat, as long you know, while we're still treating women like meat, um, I I I must say I I disagree uh, uh, very much with that. As I do with the idea that they're killing animals. I mean, what sort of animal rights group is killing ninety five percent of the animals they're taking? Taking in at their shelter, Wayne. I mean, you know, you talk about the importance of the individual animal. I'm all with you on that. But how the hell do you justify the fact that, you know, and, and that's not just a question of like, well, maybe it's a little morally problematic. It is morally problematic when you're killing 95 percent of the animals you're taking in. So, I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. I just I find these things very troubling and confusing. I, 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 I don't understand where you're coming from. And I'm trying to understand. But, you know, I don't. I must say. Let me jump in here to let people know this is Go Vegan Radio with Bob Linden. And our discussion today is with Wayne Shun of Direct Action Everywhere and Professor Gary Francione. And um, I um, am looking, um, you know, in terms of vegan activism, Wayne, um, I'm, and, you know, I, I was out there for Fur Free Friday all the time. I. Years ago, that's what I, I thought. Remember. You I know? think you came to one we organized. I, I, I was out there with my megaphone. I, I've been arrested a number of times on free speech issues related to fur. And, you know, I've, I've come to where if, if I'm going to be a vegan activist, I, I have to expand it to mean um, don't wear animals at all. So, you know, don't, don't eat them, don't wear them, don't use them. So um, why wouldn't we expand... Uh, the fur issue to to the not wearing animals and not using them so that we're it's yep. not just that we don't want fur but we don't want wool leather feathers silk uh, to be worn also and in terms of legislation uh, and and bans uh, from what I see uh, what usually happens is they don't get enforced uh, or they get overturned you know if you look yeah. at foie gras the foie yeah. gras ba- ban nobody wanted to enforce it and restaurants would just serve it for free and charge twenty dollars for a cracker you know so we're wasting all of our time where that energy and time could be going toward veganism toward toward promoting people uh, asking people to go vegan which is what the animals and the planet really need most right now. I, I, but let, I me, believe. let me let me ask you a question. I mean, well, well, let me ask you both the question. Does anybody maintain? I mean, let's assume San Francisco has a fur ban. Let's assume. I don't even know. What, I, I, I let's assume they ban for whatever that means. But let's take the most expansive interpretation well, of ban. Um, is there some idea that people are going to start wearing cotton or synthetic fabrics? 
or is is it simply the case that people are going to you know do what they do when you know when they stop eating veal they eat more you know they eat more more non veal meat they don't you know in other words this idea that we sort of target these things and then people go to vegan alternatives is a fantasy it's simply empirically wrong so if you have an anti fur campaign um, that anti, the anti-fur campaign, anti-fur campaigns have been going on now for longer than I've been in the movement, which is a long time. Um, and and the reality is the fur industry is stronger now than it was 50 years ago. And yeah, so, yeah. you know, this I, I, I don't know where you all think this is going, but but even even if San Francisco bans fur, you think the people in San Francisco are not going to continue to wear wool or leather? Of course they are. Or, or, and, buy, fur, or buy fur in Berkeley or you know yeah, exactly. wherever. I mean, so. So, so this idea that it's going to save 20,000 animals, I, I don't know. I, 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 I How's it going to save any animals? I mean, if people if people people aren't going to going to say, oh well, you know, I'm I'm getting rid of fur, and you know what? It's absolutely wrong to wear animal clothing, so I'm not going to wear wool or leather or silk or anything like that. And I'm not, you know, it's 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 like you know, meat free Monday. You know, you have meat free Monday, and what do people do? They ramp up on egg consumption. Yep. And so, you know, and as a matter of fact, didn't Bob, Bob, didn't you have somebody on your show that said that they were happy that that, but, you know, they love meat free meatless oh, it Monday. Was, it was the it, it was on another radio show, the Diane Rehm show, where uh, Paul Souter, the chairperson of the American Egg Board, was thanking meat free Mondays for the highest uh, egg sales in 30 years. Um, so and, and I, I think these things really send the wrong message. They send the idea that fur is somehow qualitatively worse than wool. It's not. They send the idea that. You know, veal is worse than other things, or that meat is worse than dairy, or whatever. Um, you know, it's stuff that's reinforced in DXE. You know, DXE has the vegan pledge, and it talks about the levels, and it talks about well, you know, you might decide you want to sit at a table where eggs and and dairy are being are being consumed. Well, you know, you're you're then sending the message. Um, you know, uh, I mean, my view is I I'll eat with anybody, even if they're eating animal products. But I will talk about the need for veganism, the idea that I'm not going to sit with somebody eating meat, but it's okay for me to eat with sit with somebody who's eating eggs or, or dairy um i mean you know my view is you educate everybody you can and you know and 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 people aren't going to understand unless you explain it to them and you can't explain it to them if you don't interact with them and so we need to interact with them but I, i'm really worried about the message that's being sent out when when wayne shun says um what I want you to do is contact Costco and tell them to cut ties with animal abusing farms. Wayne, how does that not send the message to people that you all believe that there are some farms that are not animal abusing? I mean, I mean, what sense does it make to, to write to Costco and say, cut your ties with animal abusing farms? What the hell does that even mean? I mean, well, there, are, there are farms that don't abuse animals, Gary, and, and there are orange farms and apple farms and beet farms. And Wait, wait, wait. Are you saying that the petition that you have, it could be understood by anybody as saying that Costco ought to cut its ties with every animal farm and ought to sell beets and oranges and apples? It, it, you think that's what that petition means? Because that's exactly I, what I've said to the CEO of Costco, Gary. I've sent it to him in an email. <laughs> And they can interpret it however they like, because the petition can be construed however they like to construe it. But from our perspective, if you believe that Costco should not be selling from places that abuse animals, then you're right. I'm right. And anyone else who understands that correctly is right, that that means they should be adopting a vegan policy. Are they going to do it overnight? No. But I think it'd be a great thing for them to say, even just as an optics matter, that we will not support any animal abusing business. And I think you'd agree with me on that. But, 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 but Gary, can I jump in? There, there have been a lot of points made, and I want to make sure I address them all. Sure, before sure, sure, sure. So on the property status of animals, you and I are in 100% agreement on this, that you know, your, your work is foundational on this, that if animals are property, it, it is extremely difficult or maybe even impossible to address any welfare concerns, right, because they're considered just things, that the law cannot offer any protection. And you know, your work on this issue has transformed many people's thoughts. And I know I've talked to Steve Wise. He has exactly the same perspective as you, probably based in part on your work. That the reason he works on non-human rights and not non-human welfare is because as long as animals are legally considered things, we cannot protect their welfare. So you and I are 100% in agreement on that. I think, again, the disagreement is how do we get to the point where we undermine the property status of animals? I believe that some of these incremental victories are leading to momentum and political mobilization that will ultimately conclude with the undermining of the property status of animals. And I look at the history of the gay rights movement or the anti-slavery movement or the women's rights movement, and I see many victories like this. 
in gay rights, they didn't achieve abolition of all homophobia and discrimination against LGBTQ across the country, or even in one city all at once. They had specific victories on specific single-issue campaigns. And if you know the history of the gay rights movement, it was a campaign in Hawaii that, that allowed gay marriage. And gay marriage was not LGBT equality. It wasn't the abolition of discrimination against gay folks. It was just gay marriage. But that roused millions of people around the world. And if you talk to people like Evan Wilson, who I've talked to, that was a crucial victory in mobilizing people over the next 30 years and getting to the point that LGBT equality is becoming a constitutional right. So that, right. that's the that, first point. How do we actually undermine the policy status of animals? The second thing is you've, you've raised some compelling points about various organizations, including ours, that are making ethical mistakes. In, in my perspective – I'm going to need to jump in on this uh, not when you're done. <laughs> can, I just, can I finish this oh, point? Oh, absolutely. Just, absolutely. Let me finish this point, Bob, and then I'll move on. Okay. But I, I think you're making compelling critiques of us, of Mercy for Animals and PETA. And my only suggestion to you, Gary, is to give folks the benefit of doubt. Um, just like you gave me the benefit of doubt in 2003 when you first met. I was a, completely an animal welfarist. If you had said, I'm not going to work with you, Wayne. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to even talk to you. Then I wouldn't learn from you. And And – Maybe it's just me as a Chinese person believing this, but my view is that we don't air out our dirty laundry as a movement publicly, that what we should do is privately talk to each other, have dialogue, have arguments, even yell at each other a little bit if it comes down to that. But when we argue with each other and fight with each other publicly, that serves the interest of animal agriculture, it demoralizes our activists. All the vegan education that you want PETA and Mercy for Animals to do doesn't get done because they're demoralized by your critiques. And Gary, you have such a powerful voice. I know this because I've been influenced by your voice for the past 20 years. And when you say positive things about people, it inspires them. And when you Wait, criticize them, it you, really hurts them. Think, I just do don't think, want these actives to be hurt and demoralized. I want them to be inspired to do the great work that you want, you want them to do too. Wayne, Wayne, do you think that I did not try in the 1990s to change – what do you think Rain Without Thunder was, Wayne? Do you think it was like I did it for my health? I wrote that <laughs> book because I, I wrote that book because I was trying to – change the movement. I was trying to send a signal to the movement that we were going in the wrong direction, that the animal rights movement was collapsing into the animal welfare movement. And the result was basically that book came out and everybody stopped talking to me, which was fine. I mean, it's okay. It made it clear to me that there was no movement that, the, you know, number one. Number two, I think one of the things about my critique that you have not understood is or 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 appreciated is that um when you have these groups, these charities that are competing for donations, um, you, in order to have your, your donor base as broad as possible, you've got to take positions which, comp, you know, which, which um, appeal to people you know, who are still continuing to engage in animal exploitation. And, and that's, the, that's the problem. The problem is, is these organizations, unfortunately, including DXE, um, promotes positions that I think try to make people feel comfortable, and um, and you know for example I mean the 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 denigration the DXC does on veganism I mean I suppose it may help you to sort of appeal to people who are who are not vegans, um, but again you know if we're going to ever change this situation, we're going to have to have a very large number of people who are vegan. And the only way you get people to be vegan is you talk about veganism. And yeah, when I go to the clarifying question, where do you think we denigrate veganism? Just oh my God, I, I, Wayne, I have to. I've got this. I've got it up on my screen because I was looking at it today. Okay. Uh, your 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 um your bit your thing where uh, hold on a second. I can, I can get the page. My computer is very slow. Uh, it's it's the page where you talk about you have a veganism. You know what what's the DXC position on veganism? And and I, I at I you know it's basically you're basically saying well you know veganism doesn't go far enough we've got to we've got to be anti species well first of all you know you you never have um, I, I think fairly characterized the abolitionist movement which is far far I mean which to call to say that what is going on with the abolitionist movement is consumerism I think is really unfair I think it's also I think it's it's inaccurate and I think it's um, a misrepresentation of what what the work is and what my position is I think it's a misrepresentation that's fine I don't care I mean you know a lot of people misrepresent my work so join the join the crowd oh I, I agree um, with you there Gary that the, the veganism that I'm attacking is not your veganism. It's the veganism understood by the mainstream. So okay, if every vegan in the world were Gary Francione, then, then veganism and activism would be the same. So that's we're in agreement there, Gary. Okay, okay. But but the, the, the thing is then, why do you say then that veganism shouldn't be the moral baseline? Because that's exact. – I'm looking at it. So what the what is veganism page? Um, yeah. 
and and you know you're portraying veganism in a very negative way as consumerist as focused on diet as not you know i i promote it as a matter of social justice i promote it as a matter of fundamental fairness i promote it as a matter of animal rights um and 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 also uh, you know i make the connection with violence i make the connection with non-discrimination again you know it, you know basically you know not using discrimination against humans in order to in order to achieve rights for non-humans etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think that you know the way you've characterized it you say well veganism isn't the moral baseline which is exactly my i mean you know that that's my position so you're you're saying well veganism can't be the moral baseline um, because activism has to. I still don't. You know, that's that's something, Wayne. You and I talked about that several years ago. I didn't understand it then. I still don't understand it. But what 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 I do understand is that um, veganism must be. We need ve- if if we're ever going to change this. If we're ever going to change it, it, we need to have a large number of people who are committed to abolitionist veganism. Without that, if you think. That you are going to change anything. If you think that there will be that that you know it's all going to fall because you have a victory in San Francisco or because you, Wayne, this stuff's been going on forever. These single issue campaigns have been going on forever. We had the anti fur campaign in the 1960s. We had the anti veal campaign. We had the anti foie gras campaign. We had the anti this campaign, the anti that campaign. And you know what? We're exploiting more animals now in more horrific ways than at any point in human history. It doesn't work that way. When you're talking about property status. You can't analogize that to how gay rights came into effect because we weren't talking about gay people being slaves. We were talking about whether or not, you know, how people, people's morals views, uh, uh, view, moral views about homosexuality and sexuality generally changed. But we weren't talking about about going from slavery to gay rights. We were talking about people's views about homosexuality where he, where persons already acknowledged to be full members of the moral community were involved so you can't really make the analogy and say well you know if we have if we have a couple victories that you know the victories are going to be like you know if we start like you know think about what happened in hawaii with gay rights and then it was again bottom line wayne is i've been hearing this from animal people since i was your age and younger i don't know how old you are but you're much younger than i am i'm sure <laughs> i'm a little um, bit younger than you carry <laughs> yeah and i i am sure i mean i've been hearing this from animal people for as long as i remember that what we need to do is chip away and chip away and chip away and the answer is you know what that don't work and the empirical proof is there so it's like it's like you know if you get san francisco to declare you know i mean you know what wayne it's not going to make a damn bit of difference, not a damn bit of difference. The only thing that matters is getting people to say, I'm not going to eat them. I'm not going to wear them. I'm not going to use them because you know what? Vegans don't go to circuses. Vegans don't go to, I mean, you know, people, abolitionist vegans don't do those things. We don't participate in those things. As long as you're focusing on those things as single issue campaigns, the only way, Wayne, the only way a single issue campaign can work is by putting together a coalition of people who believe that certain forms of animal exploitation are morally more odious than others and who believe that participating in the less morally problematic ones is morally acceptable. That's how single issue campaigns work. I've been writing about this for years now. That's how they work. I, I have I've really not encountered one that is any different. And so, and 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 finally, I want to I want to say something about this airing of dirty laundry. You're you, again. You are assuming that what I've got nothing in common with people who promote sexism and misogyny. Nothing in common. It's not a question of whether or not they're family members, and I want to air the dirty laundry. I've got nothing in common with people who promote sexism and misogyny. I've got nothing in common with people who give awards to slaughterhouse designers. I've got nothing in common with people who have campaigns in which they promote animal exploiters or, 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 or you know, they promote uh, cage-free eggs or crate-free pork and things. I've got nothing in common with those people. Yeah, Absolutely yeah. nothing. And so to say that, well, you know, I, I, I should not. I mean, I tried in the 1990s to say people were going in the wrong direction and everybody got upset with me. I mean, everybody got really angry with me. Um, I have a piece coming out, Wayne, which I think you might you may find of interest. Maybe not. But um, I uh, there, everything you write of interest, there, there, there's a there's a um, 
a special issue of uh, of Between the Species coming out that's dedicated to Tom Reagan. And I wrote I wrote what was for me a very difficult piece, which was about how you know the animal rights movement emerged um, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, and how it basically fell apart. Um, and, and, you know, and, and I talk a little bit about what happened, uh, in the mid 1990s that resulted in my writing rain without thunder and what happened when, um, you know, when, when the, mo- when the movement reacted very strongly against what Reagan and I were doing, because what we were doing in the first part of the 1990s was we were trying to educate the movement about, about why animal welfareism and why single is- issue campaigns were problematic. And 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 we got a very strong reaction um, in 1995, 96, as you know that that sort of era, that time, and it resulted in Tom and I parting company because Tom decided that he was going to work with the groups and he was going to you know he was gonna he was gonna he was gonna cooperate with the groups. I wouldn't do that. And and um, you know I, I, I and so I think this idea that well you know I should sit down and talk with them I've been sitting down and talking with them for a long time I mean I remember in 1991 Wayne going to the summit for animals you probably don't know I don't I don't think that exists anymore but there used to be something every year where the large the groups used to get together the heads of the groups used to get together and and they used to they used to um, they used to discuss you know, matters of common interest or whatever. And I was never at that because I didn't run a group. And, um, and I was invited, it was probably, it may have been 89, it was a long time ago. And I was invited because I was speaking out against sexism in the movement. And Cleveland Amory, who was then, he's now dead, but Cleveland Amory, who ran a group called Fund for Animals, he was then the head of the summit, and he invited me to come and speak, and I came and I spoke about sexism in the movement uh, at a time when feminists for animal rights weren't saying anything because they didn't want to say anything because they were, uh, they had reasons why they didn't want to say anything. But feminists for animal rights were being, and did not come out against the sexism and misogyny until 1994, 95, around then. So I was sort of out there by myself. Myself, talking about um, you know the problems with sexism in the movement, and I gave a, a, a talk to a group of, of leaders of the movement who like looked at me as if I had two heads. And I remember Cleveland Amory saying to me, um, "Gary, uh, you know you're a nice guy, I really like you, but I don't believe we have any position on sexism any more than we have a position on any other sort of issue that isn't related to animals." And that's the way it's always been, Wayne. But I mean, I've been trying to talk about these issues for a long time. And 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 I've been trying to to discuss these issues with people in the movement. Do you think I've never had discussions with these folks before? I went to the I went to the so-called animal rights conference in 2013, and and um, and I said, look, people, this isn't working. This happy exploitation thing is a really bad idea. And I gave my arguments, and the result was people got so upset with me that the people who funded Alex Hershaft's little party there told him if I was ever there again, they were going to withdraw their funding. And Alex wrote me an email saying that we weren't going to discuss welfare and rights anymore at the conference because it was upsetting to people. So, I mean, I, I tried, Wayne. I've really tried. And, yep. you know, um, I've really tried. But I really think that um, I think we've got to come to a fund. I mean, look, my my view is clear. We want to change the world. You change the world by getting people to commit to a vision of nonviolence where they don't eat animals, wear animals, use animals, and where they do not participate in human discrimination either. Because I'm tired of this business about the Koreans eating dogs or, you know, you know, you know, the Spanish people doing bullfights or, you know, all of this xenophobic, ethnocentric nonsense because it is corrosive. It is absolutely corrosive. I understand it's good for fundraising. Thank you for that, too, Gary, because, I mean, it's helped my community, honestly. Well, I mean, you know, you know, I see much less racism in the movement, partly because of the work you've done over the past 20 years and. You know, my community is the one that was most targeted by a lot of this stuff. I mean, I, I have to tell you, I was horrified when I saw that video of the DXC people in Venice. When yeah. uh, Ch- was Chase, what, I forget what the guy's name, Ch- I think is in the Chase first Chase Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was horrified when I saw it, and I was very disappointed when I saw the co-founder of DXC, um, whose whose name I will I will dis- I will not pronounce correctly and embarrass myself. But um, how is your co-founder's name pronounced? Priya Sahani? Okay, all right. Priya Sah- 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 Sahani? 
the honey. Uh-huh. Yeah. I saw her basically saying that she had made the decision that she wasn't going to criticize what he did. And Wayne, I have to tell you, I mean, what are we talking about here? You know, I mean, that that event was was, in my judgment, um, troubling on multiple levels. Sure. Um, yeah. Troubling on multiple levels, and instead you, you of you have coming, to explain it a little, Gary, for people listening. Who well, it was it was it was some DXE people were were having some. They were they to were. To be clear, so, it was not a DXE protest, Gary. The guy is your organizer. Okay, fine. Then yeah, he isn't a DXE organizer either. He's a supporter of ours, but he's not a DXE organizer either. He is okay. a DXE supporter for sure. Okay, um, a DXE supporter was um, was uh, uh, trying to show some videos. I don't know what the videos were, but he was trying to show some videos to some people sitting in a, from what I understand, a, a, a wine bar or something, but I'm, you know, I'm sure that they served animal products. And there was a bouncer there and uh, a, a black guy, and, and he was trying to keep them away from the window. And um, and th- these these uh, uh, DXE supporters were trying to hold the thing over the guy's head and show it to the people in the restaurant, and it resulted in um, some violence, some physical violence, and some really I-, I thought obnoxious, horrible behavior. And um, the DXE co-founder um, uh, said that she would not criticize it, and I I I was Pretty horrible. Clear. To be clear, Gary, I mean, the, one of the activists had their face fractured and their jaw broken. And I think Priya's main, and the violence, there was violence. Uh, one of the activists, not a DXC activist, not a DXC organizer, one of the activists, not Chase, did spit on somebody. And that was wrong. He did apologize for it. But the reason Priya didn't want to comment on that was because there was someone in the emergency room getting surgery, having their jaw repaired. No, no. It's, she, appropriate. She, it's kind of like when someone just died, you don't speak well, ill. Wait, wait, wait. wait, wait. She, wasn't, she wasn't not, she said... She she was actually supportive. She said, "I will not, you know, I will not in, criticize what went on there." She could have said, "Look, I oppose all violence." I mean, I, it's not clear, but it appears to I, I watched the video, and yeah. it appeared to me that the the uh, and for what I read that the DXC supporter was the guy who had the pepper spray with him. Um, but I don't know. Uh, but in any event, so there were, there was issues about pepper spray and who used the pepper spray. And apparently, um, at least what I saw was that the DXE supporter was the guy who had the pepper spray with him. What the hell people are carrying pepper spray for? I don't really know. But, um, but, but, but uh, why? Just as a factual matter though, the person who ended up in the emergency room was an animal rights activist. And I think it's just kind of like if, if you've ever been in a funeral or had someone, even someone you didn't like pass away, you don't speak ill of them because it's just a hard time for the family. It's not a question of speaking ill. It's a question but, of saying, look, we shouldn't do that sort of stuff. Sure, we sure. shouldn't We shouldn't have those sorts of events, that yeah. those sorts of events are problematic. Yeah, I, I mean, think the common strand, if I could try and tie this together, I think the common strand is, I mean, your perspective is when someone makes an ethical mistake, you have nothing in common with them, or at least if it's a serious enough ethical mistake. You know, and you mentioned Nathan Runkel in you know, his support for Cage Riggs, Ingrid Nurker and PETA and sexism. And, and this is just a fundamental disagreement between you and I. And it may, might be because our backgrounds are different. I, I come from a Buddhist background where I believe I have something in common with everyone. All life on this earth is precious. All life is connected. And, and I think you've done great work on this area, honestly, in showing the intersectionality between all these causes, the common struggles that people of color and women and LGBTQ folks and animals face. But, but my perspective is, at the end of the day, for us to actually achieve change on any of these issues, we all have to come together. And that even a slaughterhouse worker, and I don't know if you know this, but we did a big sit-in, a nonviolent sit-in. I think, I, I think you might like the action. We're completely peaceful. We bar- barely even offered a word. We walked in with a few hundred people with flowers in our hands. We just sat down in the slaughterhouse and asked them to release all the animals. And we were there with compassion in our hearts, even towards the slaughterhouse workers and the owner. And the well, result wait. of that is the slaughterhouse is now successfully allowed us to continue to continuously bear witness to go back in the slaughterhouse and release more animals and do more great vegan education with all that work we're doing and bring more people to the front lines and that was only possible because we had compassion and nonviolence in our hearts even towards someone who was hurting animals wait wait i i anyway I, I, I think it's even I more important to have compassion for folks who are doing things that are wrong because i'm not saying we shouldn't confront them and i think you've done a great job of confronting and challenging some of the injustices in the world and some of the injustices within the animal rights movement but while we challenge those those systems of oppression and those ideologies, we have to have compassion and love for the individuals in order to create change. And that's what we've done, wait, 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 not wait. just animal abusers, but people within the movement we disagree with. 
Wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. I don't need you to tell me that I need to be compassionate towards people. I think that that's really patronizing, and I'm offended by that. Um, it is not a question of my of whether I'm being compassionate. First of all, with respect to slaughterhouse workers, slaughterhouse workers aren't the problem, Wayne. Most of those people, I mean, who the hell works in the slaughterhouse? Not, I mean, it's like it's like not the job of choice for most people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's a it's a it, it, you know it, it's a horrible job. It has the highest turnover rate and the highest rate of injury. It's not a, it's not a job that a lot of people sort of are lining up to get. Slaughterhouse workers aren't the problem. Slaughterhouse owners, frankly, aren't the problem. The problem yeah. is the people who demand, you know, the people who say, I want dead animals. I want meat. I want eggs. I want cheese. I want ice cream. I want butter, whatever. Those people are the people who are driving the institutionalized exploitation. Nice. So, so you know, I, 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 I've never, I don't feel any any animosity towards people in slaughterhouses. Um, as, indeed, I see them in certain ways um, as, as in, in many ways, victimized themselves in, in, in various respects. But, but um, it's not a question of not having compassion in my heart for uh, people uh, in the animal movement who are promoting happy exploitation. I just disagree with them. Now, they turn around. I mean, I've been, I've been saying these things for a long time. And, and you know what? They don't engage the critique, Wayne. They just call me names and say really nasty things. Maybe you ought to talk to them. That's what about, I'm doing. Maybe you ought to talk to them about compassion. Maybe you ought to talk to, to some of them because I've tried to have discussions. Now, uh, part of the thing is, you know, in the 1990s, I believe that this it was possible to change things. I didn't really appreciate the extent to which the animal movement is a business. And it is a business, Wayne, and I think we've got to be clear about that. It's a business. And, and you know, Alex Pacheco once said, we're a business. We sell compassion. And I wrote about that in 1996 in Rain Without Thunder because I was somewhat disturbed by, by my friend Alex's statement in that regard. But he was right, and I didn't really appreciate in many ways um, what Alex was, was saying, um, that, you know, it's a, it's a movement that is selling something. And what it's selling is, you know, not animal rights and not veganism, because none of these groups, including your own, maintain that veganism is a moral imperative, that it is something we have an eth a moral obligation to do if we believe that animals matter morally. We don't have a choice. So it's not a question of it's not an option. It's a moral obligation in the same way that we have other moral obligations that are fundamental and that can't be compromised. And and so, you know, I mean, none of these groups promote that idea. All of them promote the idea, well, we've got to have different approaches and, you know, we can't take, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, you've got to, I mean, this idea, Wayne, that, you know, I'm all in favor of saying that we have to be compassionate to everybody. But that doesn't mean that I say that people who are exploiting animals are doing something right or that there's something wrong with my saying that all animal exploitation is morally wrong and that if you're engaging in it, you're engaging in morally wrong action. People say to me, well, but that's not compassionate. The answer is, <laughs> sorry, um, I I'm, I'm making a moral point. And if you're telling me that what compassion means is that I have to say to people that it's all right for them, that it's not morally objectionable for them to exploit animals, I can't do that. I just can't do that. And neither should you. Gary, and I totally hear you when you say your intent is not to, to scare or to hurt people. But if I told you that I've had dozens of people tell me that, honestly, even before this conversation, that you should be scared... <laughs> that Gary is going to destroy you or hurt you. And I've, I've never felt that way about you. Well, well, wait, I think scared, you scared of what? Scared of what? I, I just think scared you cannot create a climate where, because people are not going to hear your critiques if they're scared. Wayne, you, Wayne, right? Wayne, I, Wayne. I want people to hear you, Gary. I, I want people to respect the positions you have, because I think a lot of them, in fact, I'd say the vast majority, maybe 99% of them, I agree with 100%, and I think they're the right positions for the movement. But if we don't create a culture where people have enough comfort and safety in talking to each other, they feel... They can have a dialogue and not feel attacked or hurt by it. Wait, 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 wait. And I wait, think we wait, have to change things in the way we wait, communicate. Wait, wait, what, what are we talking about? Afraid or hurt? What, what are we talking about? We're we talking about the fact that I have arguments they can't respond to. Is that the problem? Because I, I don't, I, I, you know, what, what are we talking about? Attack? I, I, I'm, I'm a little confused here, and I'm a little concerned. What do you mean by attacked or hurt? Do you mean I have arguments that they can't deal with? That I have arguments that they don't want to deal with? Is that what we're talking about? Because that's the only that's the only thing I see. I see a bunch of people out there 
who are doing things that 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 are completely problematic. I make the arguments, and then they turn around and they call me names. So, I mean, what do you want from me, that, Wayne? No, that, that's not appropriate either. I mean, if anyone, even on my Facebook page, if somebody says something negative and critical and, and hateful towards you, I mean, I, I want to delete that. That's not okay. I think the basic issue is a lot of times what you're saying might not be a personal attack, but whenever a powerful and eloquent person publicly criticizes you, it's perceived as extremely hurtful. And what I... My, my suggestion, and, and I totally apologize if this is patronizing, because I, you know, you have 30 years more experience than I do, and there's so many things that you know way better than I do. But my suggestion is, if we have critiques of each other within the movement, it'll create a better culture of communication if we raise them with each other privately instead of attacking each other on Facebook. Because okay, I think. Can I, can I uh, jump in for a second here, just uh, to let yeah. people know that this is Go Vegan Radio with Bob Linden at GoVeganRadio.com. On Twitter at Go Vegan Radio, Facebook Go Vegan Radio with Bob Linden, and then when uh, when you want to calm down after hearing all of this, go turn on RadioBobby.com or twenty four seven music station. So, so do what, you what think it's I, good I, people wait, are scared I, of you? I mean, I just don't. I don't think it's good because I think they should be reading your books. I think they should be following your Facebook page as I follow your Facebook page and as I read your books. I mean, I still recommend eat like you care to folks, but the fact that people are scared to talk to you affects their ability to listen to what you're saying and i just what don't want to what do you mean scared to talk to me what do you mean what what what, what do I you mean, what does that mean wayne does that mean anything more yes. than i have arguments they can't res they can't respond to what does it mean wayne are I they think it means they think they're going to be put you know out into the public and and just put in the stocks and shame the way people used to in 300 400 years ago in the united states when they committed some you know sometimes spurious but sometimes real crime and we've moved away from public shaming as a way to address moral flaws in human beings. And I, you know, I'm a great believer in restorative justice, even even for the most egregious and violent crimes. That even when people are killers, you know, we should have compassion for them and try and restore them rather than shame them. And I think a lot of what you do, whether it's meant to be, I don't think you intend to do this, but the effect is is people feel ashamed of themselves. And people who are ashamed are not powerful activists. And are not willing to listen, are not able to educate themselves. It's like a student. You're a teacher. And if you shamed one of your students on a regular basis, they probably just stopped coming to class. You well, know? Wait, 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 wait. But this, this word, these, you're using these words as if they have uh, to shame. Now, let's talk yeah. about shaming for a second. So, so if somebody has, a, has an event where um, there is some really egregious sexism – or some sort of violence or some sort of racist behavior, and I call it out and I say I think that that's wrong. Or if um, you know I object to PETA's campaigns, or I think that uh, Mercy for Animals promotion of happy exploitation is really problematic, and I say that. Uh, and by the way, I happen to think that the so sorts of things that many of these groups do is every bit as bad as what the meat industry itself does. Because in many ways, the whole happy, happy exploitation movement is an adjunct to what they're doing, you know, to, is, is a, an adjunct to the institutionalized exploitation of animals. So when I call that out and I say, I think that's a really bad idea, um, then – that that's shaming. I'm sorry. I I res I object to that word. I'm not shaming anybody. I'm making an argument that this makes no sense for these reasons. If you think I'm wrong, then you tell me why my argument's not valid. But to say that you can't respond to my argument, but you are shamed, and that I shouldn't shame people is basically what you're saying is I should not stand up for fundamental rights and for the justice of 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 ex of non not exploiting non-human animals in a, in, a, in a very clear way. You're saying I shouldn't do that because it results in shaming people. I'm sorry, Wayne. I, I, can't, I can't accept that, number one. Number two, number two people know if, if, if anybody was interested in having a discussion with me, they know what I mean. I know these I know, I mean, some of the younger people I don't know, but, you know, some of the folks that have been around a while who are still around, I've known these people for decades, Wayne. So I mean, you know, they know where to they know where to find me, and they know what my arguments are. And I and I just I didn't start making them last week. I've been making them now for twenty five years, twenty eight years, whatever. And and I mean, come on, I mean, at this point in time, um, you know, it's not a question of, you know, if they if they have nothing to say, if after all of this time these people don't have any responses to my argument. Come on. I mean, what are we talking about here? I mean, you know, they don't like what I say, so they feel shamed. I don't even know what the hell that means. 
I mean, I, I have no idea even what that means, Wayne. I have no idea what that means. So what I'm suggesting is if anybody really gives a darn about animal rights, if anybody really wants to, you know, to understand, I mean, I'm more than happy. I am more than happy, Wayne. My offer is out there. I'll be happy to go to any of these groups and have discussions with them about why single issue campaigns are counterproductive, why welfareist campaigns are counterproductive, why sexism, racism, xenophobia, ethnocentrism is really problematic. I'm more than happy to do that. I mean, I've written about it, but if they don't, if they would like to hear it from me orally or they'd like to talk with me about it, that's fine. They know where to find me. They're not breaking down my doors, Wayne. They're not really breaking down my doors. Well, we will. We'll take you up on that offer, Gary. Yeah, I, okay. I would genuinely love to hear your perspective on the fur campaign, for example, and what we can do to make it more abolitionist and effective, just just for the record. Okay. Can I uh, – <laughs> I'd like to uh, jump in here and uh... – I, I may have an opinion, <laughs> which I'd like to express. Um, so, Wayne, not, I'm certainly not shaming. Um, I uh, and and don't worry about me. I'm in a position, <laughs> so no, feel free to attack me. No, I'm, no, I'm talking more no, about. Just, no right. one's attacking anybody. It's a yeah. question of criticism. No one's attacking. Let's be careful about the language we use. It's not attacking. It's right, criticizing. Right, right. And, and, and Wayne, I, I I believe that you come from a, a position of really caring for caring for animals, and that you're. Uh, very concerned and compassionate, and I, I feel like um, I feel like you and uh, the public and so many others have been duped uh, by these organizations who are nothing more than the meat, dairy, fish, and egg industries in disguise. They're wearing the masks of animal advocates, and I say this because. Well, because of their policies, but I mean, you know, just out front, the Humane Society of the United States is a member of an international federation, an international uh, so-called livestock federation, uh, whose mission is to meet the uh, demand, a 70% demand in so-called livestock products by 2050. Uh, it's been run by a pig farmer. It has distributed bacon coupons. Um, I don't know how we can think of these groups as animal charities or animal advocates other than they have appointed themselves and we're believing them. Um, yeah. and Let me give you an example, Bob, because HSUS is such a great example. And, and You may know this, but I sat down with Josh Balk, the, the lead of their farm animal team, just a few weeks ago. And, and we got criticism for it, saying, why are you sitting down with Josh Balk? He's part of HSUS. They're welfarists. They've done all the things, these things that you don't agree with. And the reason I think we need to work with people like Josh Balk, and the reason I think Josh Balk is different from the animal industry, is Josh Balk has spent every waking moment of his life over the past 15 years, every penny of his personal fortune, every minute of his personal time advocating for animals as effective as he can. And while he but may be selling cage free eggs to corporations, but he, but he might be doing things like that that you disagree with. No, 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 it's not. It's not. But, Josh but, Balk but, but, and yeah, the we Field, Bob, I'm sorry, because Josh is someone who genuinely cares about animals and wants to help animals. Well, and frankly, I learned things from Josh Balk too. You know, Josh's perspective is the reason we have to do these incremental measures and the reason we, we have to kind of be a little bit secretive about our actual positions. And Josh is a vegan. He believes ultimately in a vegan world is he believes we can't be out there and just say what we really believe. And I I'm with you. I'm with you, Bob. I'm with you, Gary, and that we should say what we no, believe. No, Wayne, Wayne, we, we can't be out there lying, though. We, we can't be the voices of – we cannot be the voice of animals and be and be sure. lying. Now, let's well, go on to Mercy. I think Josh would say it's not lying. It's about strategic communications. Wayne, Wayne, he's any, anybody who sells cage-free <laughs> eggs, anybody yeah. who sells cage-free eggs is an egg salesman. They're, yeah. they're part of the egg industry. But it's here's a, the big point, Bob. Can I just make one more point, and then I'll pass it on to you? Is that all yeah. right? Go ahead. Okay. So my bigger point is, even if I'm wrong about Josh, and Josh is wrong about Josh, and HSUS is not a good organization, which I think HSUS does a lot of really good things. I think they do things that are wrong, too, and obviously I don't believe in cage free eggs, but I do think they do good things. But even if I'm wrong about Josh, and Josh is wrong about Josh, you know, if we just attack Josh and say that you're as bad as an egg industry salesperson who doesn't care about animals at all, all he has to do is look into his own heart and realize – that's clearly false because I care about animals immensely. I spent every waking moment of my life over the past 15 years. I spent every penny of my personal fortune. I don't take a dime from the animals. And, and for the record, um, since you said this previously, I have not taken a dime from DXC. I'm a net donor to DXC to the tune of tens of thousands of dollars, and I'm still a partner at a law firm. That's how I make my own money, and Josh Balk is exactly the same way. He doesn't take a dime for the animals. 
He's doing everything he can to fight fans. I, I think he's he a partner in Hampton see, Creek, isn't he? He's a partner in Hampton Creek. He's uh, one of the founders, but he's taken no equity at all in Hampton Creek and has not made a single dime. Well, right. well, if, if he really cared about the animals, he would educate John, himself John, and uh, not be doing what just, he's doing. Just, Go ahead. I'm almost done, Bob, if I could just finish this quick point quickly. Go ahead. When, when Josh believes in his heart and heart and knows in his heart, heart of hearts that he cares about animals and people sit, tell him he's no different than the egg industry, he's going to feel attacked and shamed. And as someone who's a person of color and someone who honestly did not have a lot of confidence 20 years ago, I'm a very different person than I was 20 years ago. But I remember one of the really formative influences and, and experiences I had as a student was making mistakes, going to an economics workshop at the University of Chicago among Nobel Prize winners, saying something that was clearly wrong and stupid, and having an amazing professor by the name of Mark Duggan take me to the side privately afterwards and share with me why my position was wrong. Going to the University of Chicago Law School and having all these frankly, false beliefs about how animal lawyers can make all these effective changes for animals. And having Gary Francione take me to the side and have personal conversations with me, share with me a little bit about his work, his book. And do, I still remember the conversation I had. It was the three of us, Gary. It was another student at the University of Chicago Law School, me and you. And you took us aside and explained to us why you thought you know, all these welfare campaigns were not effective. And if you had publicly attacked me when I had raised the question at the seminar, then I would not have been willing to talk to you. And, and similarly, if we publicly attack people like Josh Balk, even if he's wrong, he's not going to listen to us. Well, he's, he's not in my movement. You see, I, 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 again, he, he, is in, he is in the egg he industry, can. Wayne. Wayne, sure. when, when somebody sells eggs on a corporate basis and lies to the public about them, well, he has taken a public position. He's, he's in a, a, a position uh, with a, you know, a public visibility position with the Humane Society of the United States. And if he's doing something to the detriment of animals, he has to be called out on that. So let me, let, me go on, let me go on to Mercy for Animals. Were you done? Can I go on to Mercy for Animals for a second here? Yeah. Bob, before you go on to Mercy for Animals, may I make a statement? I, I want to correct something. Um, Wayne, if you have read my work, you know okay. one thing is clear, and that is I go out of my way to say I'm not making moral judgments about people. Yeah. I don't know. What, I don't know what's in their hearts. I don't know. I don't even remember whether I've ever met Josh Balk. Um, I don't know whether I have or not. Um, He's a great but, guy. He'd love to talk to you. Uh, but I, I don't, I don't make moral judgments about these people. I do make judgments about their positions that they take, and I think it is morally obscene to promote cage-free eggs. I think it is actually it – is, it is, it's promoting animal exploitation. The fact that you think that it has some strategic – I mean that's like saying you, know, you promote um, you know, humane slavery because you think it has some strategic value. If you promote well, look, slavery – That's my position. That's Josh's position, Gary. I understand it. I understand yeah. it. But what I'm saying is um, what, what troubles me – and and what makes me um, well what what I what I don't um, really I'm, I'm not going to engage anymore in this conversation is this idea that um, if one se if one takes a position that the you know Josh Balk is not consulting me before he promotes cage free eggs he knows my views he's not promoting me so if I take the position that I think that cage free eggs is really is is odious and I think that that, that HSUS or Josh Balk or anybody's promoter aid mercy for animals or whatever uh, promotion of these things is really problematic that's not attacking them that's not shaming them that is simply making an argument that the position that they're taking is not morally justified and to then say well if you didn't attack people and you didn't you know shame them and you didn't blah 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 the answer is i'm not i i, I don't really know what goes on in josh balk's heart or in nathan runkle's heart or what any i have no idea what these people think and i'm not in i'm not a priest i'm not a spiritual leader i'm not really interested in judging them i am interested in in issues of fundamental justice as they affect non-human animals and as a result i cannot i i feel morally obligated to speak out that the entire movement, I mean, remember something, Wayne, these are multi-zillion dollar organizations that have these big advertising campaigns. I'm a professor at Rutgers University. I have no organization. I have no, no organization whatsoever. I'm just, you know, and I make the arguments. And now all of a sudden, because I make arguments that these people can't deal with, I'm threatening them, I'm shaming them, I'm attacking them. I'm not attacking anybody. I'm making arguments. I don't know what goes on in your heart. I don't know what goes on in Josh Balk's heart. And and frankly, it's that's not my, my concern. My concern is I want to change the way people think about non-human animals. I want to stop animal exploitation. And the only way that, that that is going to happen is if we have a significant abolitionist vegan movement. 
And I'm dealing with all of these organizations that say, that's oh, divisive, that's terrible, that's extremist, that's this, that's that. And, you know, and then I got DXE saying, oh, well, you know, veganism is just basically consumerist, you know, consumerism and doesn't go far enough. Never even acknowledging that there are your website does not have a darn thing. That, you know, that says, well, you know, there are some visions of veganism that are more thoroughgoing, but, you know, um, you know, but but the mainstream vegan position doesn't go far enough. That's right, Wayne. But you know what? The mainstream vegan position is is promoted by the organizations that you support. Anyway, I'm I'll let you guys go at it. I'm just going to sit back and listen. because OK, I'm, I, so so I'm, 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 my my adrenaline, my 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 blood is boiling for a second here um, because I, I do want to continue to be divisive. I do want to separate myself from the animal betrayal specialists who masquerade. If I could just make one point quickly, though, no, Bob, Gary, that's a great point. We're going to change the website based on that feedback. I agree with you that we should we should cite your work. We should say we're talking about the mainstream vegan position. There are abolitionist vegan positions that make veganism, you know, synonymous with activism. That that speaking out and standing against injustice is part of the vegan identity for a lot of powerful advocates, including Gary Francione. So I will commit to changing that on the website or asking our website team to change it. I should say. Oh. I'm writing a note to myself right now to do that. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll wait till you're done so you can hear me. Go, go ahead, Bob. I'm done. <laughs> okay. I forgot what I was going to say. No, not really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Wayne, uh, Mercy for Animals uh, used to oppose cage-free eggs. Uh, on its website, it said, don't believe the egg industry hype. Uh, Mercy for Animals was uh, given millions of dollars by the Open Philanthropy Project to promote cage-free eggs, and uh, now it is the egg industry hype. The Open Philanthropy Project has given the Humane Society of the United States, Mercy for Animals, uh, the Humane League, Animal Equality, uh, there's Compassion and World Farming, all, all of these groups, millions of dollars to promote cage-free eggs. They are all the egg industry hype, according to Mercy for Animals, when it may have still had a shred of morality and was honest about it. Now we have all of these groups invading California with the uh, Prevent Cruelty Act, gathering signatures to prevent, um, prevent farm animal cruelty. So if you're telling me that grinding up every male chick after birth, after mutilating every female, debeaking her, imprisoning her in harsh confinement with tens of thousands of other birds, and then murdering every single hen is the prevention of cruelty, then um, where are we at all? This is all deception. It's, it's all These same groups used to oppose... Um, enriched battery cages. It used to be on their websites. The, the battery cages were unacceptable to the physiology and psychology of the birds. And then the Humane Society of the United States entered into a partnership with the United Egg Producers and all of these groups reversed their positions and campaigned for those battery cages. There's, there's not a shred of morality in these groups. Animal Charity Evaluators uh, makes these groups top charities every single year none of them promotes veganism they've all run from the word veganism so what I'm saying is that you and the public have been duped into thinking that the industry is actually an animal rights movement it is really a group of animal betrayal specialists masquerading as an animal movement and DXE should be, pro be protesting against them as it does against anybody else well, for all the money that you say the Open Philanthropy Project and HSUS has, it's tiny compared to what Cal Maine has, to what JS West has, to what Smithfield has. And, and, and I agree with you in many regards, Bob, that k tree eggs are not the solution, that they're not humane. And frankly, I think most of the folks at HSUS would say the same. When I've talked to Josh Balk and Wayne Paselli about k tree eggs, they're quite clear about it, too, that k tree eggs are not humane. That it's their, it's their main cruelty. campaign. It's their, they don't save one life. They, 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 they don't save say, anybody they say is if we're going to get to a world where animals are not hurt at all, we believe that cage-free eggs are a good incremental step. Now, you may disagree with that. I may disagree with that. But that doesn't mean they're bad people, and it doesn't mean they're the same as the egg industry. It's because not a question of whether they're bad people, Wayne. Do you think that you say, is really justifiable? Very, very, do you think say, it's morally justifiable? Wayne, do you think it's morally justifiable? I absolutely do not think it's morally justifiable to exploit any animal. But when we say that there is no difference between Josh Balk a good person who spends all of his waking hours fighting for animals 
in the egg industry, which is profiting off the exploitation of animals. Well, well they are too. They're profiting off of the... Of the but your, what, 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 implication, what, what you're saying is that these people have the same intent. They do. They I think do. we no, have to care uh, so, so, so let me, let me go back to Paul Sauter. Well, there will be strategic... Could I, if I could just finish my point, if that's all right, folks. Go ahead. It, it's, it's totally appropriate to say strategically, tactically, I think this tactic is counterproductive. But when Let's we kill all them, the animals. It's, it's, a, it's a tactically productive strategy. Let's kill them all and torture them all and well, imprison them all. Say, right? And tell the public it's good. By imposing these sorts of protective measures, we'll increase the costs for eggs. More and more people will go vegan. Wait, wait, what, what protective measures? What, what's the protective measure? measure? Now, what, what? I, I'm offering Josh's argument, not because I believe in it, because I don't. And I've, I've talked to Josh directly about this. I've talked to Lewis Bollard about this. I think Lewis Bollard is making a big mistake. Lewis Bollard is the one... Is the, is the program officer for the Open the Philanthropy Project. He's the one who funds all these groups with cage-free eggs. He knows. I've written. I've investigated so many cage-free farms. I know. I mean, you know. I mean, Gary, you've made the very insightful point that as long as animals are commodified, you don't even have to do the investigation. You know they're going to be abused because commodification itself is a form of abuse. So well, Lewis knows that this is the case, but he believes over the long term the way for us to get to a point where these animals are not commodified is to chip away at these sorts of welfare programs. Now, again, you don't have to agree with that. I don't have to agree with that. In fact, we probably don't agree with that. But demonizing them, saying they're equivalent to the egg industry, is very, very different. Saying <laughs> when, when you sell them, eggs, Wayne, when not. you sell eggs, you are in the egg industry. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I, how can we be so duped? If you sell eggs, yeah. you're in the I, egg industry. Now, let me, let me just go back to one second, one second here. Wayne, 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 Wayne. So on, on the same Diane Ream show, I referred to it before, where, where the uh, chairman of the egg uh, board said, that uh, Meat Free Monday has been a bonanza for uh, the sales of eggs. He also said, when HSUS has a client who wants cage-free eggs, we supply them. So, you know, come on. Come on, they they they're they're all tied in with the egg industry, with United Egg Producers. This is their. How how can you justify the lies that cover this up? How can you justify a happy face on cage-free eggs? That is like. That's an obscenity, yeah. right? There. Yeah, we can't, Bob, which is why we challenge it. But we have to understand that a lot of the folks who are doing these programs, they are they are being duped by the industry. You know, when the industry says our eggs are cage free or our turkey is free range, you know, I've talked to these folks. They're shocked by the findings of our investigations. We went to Diesel Turkey Ranch and found out that none of those turkeys were ever ever stepping outside even a day of their lives. The folks at HSUS were, were shocked by it, and they wanted to create change too. So. We have to give these folks the benefit of the doubt that they believe Why? that I don't animals, believe that. I don't believe that. I think we should give everyone the benefit of the doubt. I think we should give an egg industry CEO the benefit of the doubt. And when I when I talk to the Costco CEO, when I talk to John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods, who hates my guts, you know, he, he, he every time I send him an email, he, he does write back to me, but he always says nasty things and he's not willing to talk to me. But I still give him the benefit of the doubt because in every human being's heart, you know, I believe this as a Buddhist, I believe this as, as, an, as an animal. Uh, who has the capacity to empathize and believes other animals have the capacity to empathize too, that everybody wants to do the right thing. And if we don't believe in people, they're not going to change. So I think we should come at this when there are strategic and ethical disagreements within the movement, but even outside of the movement, come at it from a perspective where we believe in people, and when we believe in people, they'll change. Again, Wayne, I don't accept that they're the animal rights movement. I believe that they are the egg even industry. If they're not, this is egg even industry infiltration of an animal sure, rights movement. So you're making a very important sociological and strategic point, which is that co-optation is a danger to the movement, and there's extensive sociological research about this. And, and I've read this, I know Gary's read this, that whether it's the fair trade movement, the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, corporations have done a very good job of strategically infiltrating movements to try and undermine them. So I agree that's a concern. And anytime money is changing hands, we should be transparent about that. So when, when Humane Society Mercy for Animals is getting money from a big corporate donor, they should be transparent about that. You know, and but at the end of the day, the the reality is most of these people are taking this money because they believe that it's going to be effectively used for animals. And while there's a lot to be said about but, money, but Mercy for and, Animals said cage-free uh, eggs are egg industry, industry hype. hype. Why did they take the money then? What point? If if you look at the history of social justice, while fundraising is not fun, and for most of my career as an activist, I have not raised a dime. You do have to pay the bills somehow. And you do have to pay people salaries. You have to take animals out of these horrendous places and give them veterinary care. And every social justice movement in history has succeeded partly because they've been able to raise some limited amount of resources. We don't have to fight the battle dollar for dollar. I mean, Smithfield is a $14 billion company. We're never going to raise $14 billion for animals. But we do need a small amount of funds 
to fund our most important campaigns and objectives, to pay for the vegan literature that Gary believes in, to pay for the videos that we want to show people in the public, to pay for the books. Well, I'm, like I'm a nonprofit that can, can that can hardly so, pay for the phone, so, to tell you the truth. So, gentlemen, I'm not going to. I'm. I, so gentlemen, we should, people should be supporting you, but we do have to be, do some limited amount of fundraising. And the fact that HSUS and Mercy for Animals take some amount of funds to do their advocacy is, in my view, not a reason to tarnish them. To do obscene okay, so advocacy. You need to pay the bills, Bob. If you were to do some fundraising and raise some monies to have this vid radio program continue, I would not want to tarnish you on on that basis. Well, if, Look, I, if, if I supported cage-free eggs, I would deserve to be tarnished. If, if the Open Philanthropy Project came to me and said, we'll give you a million dollars like they did to, to uh, Mercy for Animals, which was opposed to cage-free eggs, if it came to me with a million-dollar check, I would have to rip it up, you know? I mean, like, where, where do we draw the line here, you know? I mean, it's really... I think MFA's position is that cage-free eggs are wrong. They're not humane, but they're progress. So it's not that they're trying to sell cage-free eggs. It's that they don't see the universe of possibility out there. And so we have to expand that universe of possibility. We have to, ex to show the mercy for animals of the world that you can be an advocate for all animals, that you don't have to accept the industry lies. But, well, but if we uh, don't do that – When the industry lies come problem. from the animal advocates, though, then, uh, then we're in trouble. Gentlemen, I, 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 uh, it's 7.37, and um, I have some place to be at 8 p.m., uh, and I'm going to probably be late anyway. I didn't realize it was going to go this long. I just want to thank you both for hosting this. I'm happy to, to continue this at some later time. I just want to say one final thing, Wayne, and that is um, – I certainly agree and have said that, you know, most people think that what they're doing is the right thing. Most people don't don't, um, you know, think that they're bad or that they're doing things which are morally wrong. People talk themselves into things. They justify things in various ways. I believe animal exploitation is wrong. I do not think that animal advocates should be promoting it. I think that it is it is morally wrong. And I also think it is um, uh absurd to believe that we are going to, by making animal exploitation supposedly more humane, that we are going to eliminate animal exploitation. Uh, what, ana what the history of the animal welfare movement going back to the 19th century has taught us is that the more people become comfortable with animal exploitation, the more animal exploitation actually increases. So I think that, um, you know, I mean, I'm sure that Josh Balk, you know, and, and I know Wayne Purcell uh, personally, I've known him for many years, and I'm sure that these folks all believe that, you know, what they're doing is right. Um, and I'm sure that they have sincere beliefs, and I sincerely believe that they're very wrong. And I believe that I, not only do I think that they're, do I sincerely believe that they're wrong, but I believe as an advocate for justice for non-humans, I have an obligation to say why they're wrong. If they take that as shaming, or as or you know or reasons to be frightened of me or whatever i'm really sorry but um you know and 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 when you talk about what we could do if we all put ourselves into creative nonviolent vegan advocacy if we a lot many people not everybody but many people really do care morally about animals and what we've done is create a movement in which we have told them that if they avoid things like fur or they buy cage free eggs or they buy crate free pork or whatever they can discharge their moral obligations to animals that's absurd that's wrong it's morally mm -hmm. wrong and we're never going to as a practical matter get anywhere with that sort of 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 position so you know i i i, I hear what you're saying i understand what you're saying one one thing you you made the point about well you know you got to bring in some money and the answer is any dollar brought brought in by exploiting animals is an ill-gotten gain in my judgment i don't care whether you got to pay the bills if you're bringing in money by selling out animal interests that's really problematic i want to thank you both extremely very much it's been an interesting discussion um, sure. And and I I I um, I hope that uh, I wish you both well. And Bob, I will be talking with you. And I'm Wayne. I'm more than happy to um, to continue this discussion at some point. But I also think that um, I've been doing this for 35 years. My arguments have been out there for. Th I've been making these arguments. I've been talking to people for 35 years. And you know what? I I actually um, uh, if I did not hit. <laughs> 
I believe that um, that the movement has been hijacked. I think it's become a business. And that's not to say that I think that these people are bad people. I just think it's become a business. And I think that, you know, when you are in the business of raising funds, you compromise. It just it just it's inevitable. It's inevitable. It's 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 not just the animal movement. It's happened in other movements as well. But it's been a real problem with the animal movement. The animal movement has really, you know, lost it, it really lost its way in the 1990s, and it's just – it's not only lost lost its way, but it's getting more and more lost as every year goes by. More and more. Um, more and more. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. And so I, I want to thank you both very much for this opportunity, and and um, and I I, uh, I look forward to discussing these issues in the future, but I really do have to go. Because okay, I can, didn't... You, can, you, can you stay like one more minute, and we'll just yeah, hear Wayne? Just, Wayne, like just sure, Wayne. Can stay, come, I can stay, four more minutes. Wayne would like to say something in conclusion, yeah, I, I guess, because – you 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 hang you're hanging up may disconnect us all so oh, okay. <laughs> let's see what happens if uh, uh, Wayne has some uh, a final thought here. So my final thought is just to thank you, Gary, for the work you've done over those 35 years and changing the minds of many people, including me today. And I hope you just give everyone else in the animal rights movement the same benefit of the doubt. The next time you're in the Bay Area, or even if you aren't in the Bay Area, I'd love to have you come personally speak at the Berkeley Animal Rights Center and share some of your critiques of DXC. I think all of us would really cherish that opportunity. And then I hope the next time in the Northeast, I'll, I'll hit you up again and, and see if you're willing to sit down personally, too, because, you know, I, I actually don't think we've actually been in the same room together since 2003, 2004. And I'd love to just reconnect because I've learned immensely from all the work you've done. And while there's some differences, I, I think at the end of the day, we have so much more in common than we disagree on. And, and it's important to point that out and emphasize that, too. Well, we'll talk about that, Wayne. But thank you very much for your kind words. And thank you, Bob. Okay, thank you, uh, Gary, and thank you, Wayne. We'll talk again soon. Thanks, Bob. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Bye-bye. My pleasure. Thank you.